Thanks, Sarah. Hi, hi everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, uh, depending on where, where you're listening from. Um, th thanks for joining. We're going to talk today about the impact of safety professionals. And that's a bit of a broad word, that word impact. So what I'd love for people to do is to dive into the chat. And when, when I say the impact of safety professionals or the impact that safety professionals have, let's think about the positive impact that we have in our organization. What is the impact that you're trying to make? What are you, what are you trying to do um, to, to, what are you trying to achieve in your organization um, as a safety professional? So if you can just start throwing some ideas in the chat about what does that mean to you? What are the outcomes that you want in your organization? Um, um, how are you trying to get them? Um, Okay, so let's just pile in a few things there, and let's just see see what we're see what we're talking about when we talk about impact. Because there's no right answer in here. There's and there's many answers. In fact, there's many right answers. So let's dive in a little bit a little bit about me. Um, so people might know I I, I run a consulting business, ForgeWorks. Um, I co-hosted a podcast for over a year now called The Safety of Work, which is about evidence based safety practice, and and um, that's going going quite well. I'm an adjunct at Griffith University. And just recently, some people might have seen I've launched a, um, a safety futures um, program around safety professional training. So, you know, that's uh, really excited about that 12 week boot camp to just, you know, try to get underneath some of these skills and capabilities that we need to have impact. And like we're going to see in this conversation, impact is a very broad, um, a very broad type of concept. So in, um, Two things, let's start with two things that occupy most of my thinking. So two questions, if I, if I was to say in the last five years, what two questions have I thought the most about? This idea of safety work versus the safety of work. So all of the safety work that we do in our organization, so our, our safety management systems, our safety audits, our safety investigations, our safety training, our safety inspections, our safety risk assessments, all of these things that we do to try and achieve safety outcomes, and, and we'll talk about those, versus the safety of work, which is how safe is work when people are doing it. And we kind of assume that there's a correct, a really clear relationship. We write a procedure, people follow it, they're safe. Or we do an audit, we fix a few problems, then they're safe. Uh, we do a toolbox talk, then um, people know how to be safe. And Or we do a risk assessment before a job, and that identifies and resolves everything and people go on to be safe. So, so that's occupied a lot occupied a lot of my thinking. And the only thing I'd stop and ask people to briefly reflect on is um, think of all those things I've just mentioned and think of all the things that you do in your organization to manage safety. Sitting from where you are as a safety professional, all the things that you rely on, all the levers you've got to pull. And then think about outside of work, how you how you manage safety for yourself and your family and your friends. So do you... Do you do a vehicle pre-use inspection before you hop in the car to drive down the shops? Do you sit down with your kids and do a JSA form before you take them out on a bike ride? Um, I suspect a few of you are reflecting and going, well, actually many of the things that I think or our organization thinks create safety uh, aren't necessarily the things that I rely on outside of work to create safety for myself and my family and my friends normally. So, so that disconnect is what I'm really fascinated about with this idea of safety work versus the safety of work and, and should we expect people at work to um, to be any different um, and so these ideas of safety clutter have come into that as people would be familiar with but most importantly for me um, is the second question that question of what is the role of a safety professional and people who know me will know that that's all I've ever done um, in my career um, I've worked in many industries at many levels of organizations and I did my PhD with that exact question, what is the role of a safety professional? And that's what I'm hoping to talk about today from an impact point of view. So just to have a look, little bit of a look through um, some of the chat. So influence the culture, fewer injuries, educate, culture, role model, reduce risk, um, better operational learning, um, make safety part of the normal conversation, the way we do business, buy-in from senior management, self-actualization, um, so all these things, open-minded thoughts and actions, being educated. So there's a few themes in there about reducing risk and therefore injuries, educating, um, integrating safety in the way that we do work um, and getting engagement from people, getting engagement from management around safety. So all really important things and how we have impact. Now, 
in about two, in I think 2015, um, David Boris did a study on the value proposition of the OHS professional, and it's worth a read. Um, he, uh, I think, it's actually called you know the value proposition of the OHS professional, um, and and he looked at all of a whole lot of studies that looked at the impact or the influence on on safety professionals with other things, other things that were measurable in the organisation, and interestingly. There's only been two studies that have shown a relationship between either the numbers of safety professionals in a company or the fact that safe of companies do have safety professionals and um, a reduction in injuries. So for all of the tens, maybe maybe millions or tens of millions of safety people that there are in the profession around the world, we actually don't know very well what this direct connection is between the safety person in a business and the injury rate or the incident rate that people happen. Now that's not surprising. That's actually not surprising. The more that I've thought about it and looked into it, it's not surprising because, you know, all the things that we talked about of the things that we could impact in the chat that you guys have just dropped in there, they're things that come between the safety professional and the injury. It's you know I'm going to influence engagement, so then people make better decisions, so then they have fewer injuries. So we've got these kind of steps that need to happen in our organisation between the things that we do as a safety professional and you know the 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 end outcome, which I think it'd be fair to say that we were all hoping to achieve in our organization, which is, you know, fewer significant or, or no um, serious injuries or fatalities. So what does the state of current safety professional practice look like then? If, if these are all the things that you, that on this call you've dropped into the chat that might be worth us influencing, it's a little bit different to a lot of the day-to-day -day work. So I'm not sure if people have said, this is what I'm trying to influence, or this is what I think my work today currently influences. And, and they may be two separate questions. And I apologize for not asking them as two questions. But in my, in my research, where I followed um, a bunch of safety professionals for six or seven months and, and talked, here's just one quote of many that, that sort of talks about, well, I'll read it out, risk assessments at the end of the day. In my view, they're a bit like you work backwards from whatever outcome your management manager wants. That's just the reality of it. So this idea that um, that management that, that we're there to serve management, we're there to help management deliver on management's objectives, and we're there to put in place safety processes, safety practices, safety training, safety things to to um, help help our managers get what they need. And and what I want to do now is I just want to go backwards before we go forwards, before we can talk about the impact that we're having, and, and I'm going to go through sort of eight ways to to increase impact and talk a little bit about those. I just want to go backwards and talk about my um, interpretation of the evolution of the safety profession over the last 30 years. And if, if there's questions that you've got in your mind, just drop them in the Q&A throughout the conversation so that then by the time I finish talking, um, we're kind of ready to go with some, with some questions. So let's talk about where we might have, where we might have come from. So look, prior to, Prior to the, let's say about the late eighties, organization, so organizations have been trying to manage safety well since the industrial revolution, you know, because, you know, particularly in the early 20th century, then between 1910 or so and 1940, um, incidents just cost business money. So anything that sort of incidents that disrupted equipment or disrupted labor, um, more so the equipment than the labor because um, labor was far more replaceable than the equipment. Um, Organizations started to get interested in in um, in safety management, and we saw that. And, and and there was dedicated safety roles that can be traced back to you know over a hundred years ago within organizations. But up until about the mid '80s, they were largely what I describe as like a safety technician. There were roles that were there to manage individual risks that were central to production. So they might be a safety observer on a machine, making sure it didn't overheat, or observing the mechanical ventilation of an underground mine, or observing a clear deck on an aircraft carrier, or observing kind of like, um, you know, chemical separation and chemical management in a refinery or something like that. So these roles were there because if they weren't there and something went wrong for safety, there'd be a significant production impact. Um, and that was to be avoided. So there was full-time safety technician type roles. Now, what kind of happened in the, in the 80s um, or through the 80s is we got this sort of confluence of a whole heap of, um, a whole heap of disasters. So we know we had Chernobyl, we had Challenger, we had Exxon Valdez, we had Piper Alpha, we had Japan Airlines, one, two, three. We had all of these, um, almost every um, major industry um, was left, was no major industry was left unscathed. 
through um, the mid the mid eighties, and so we also had this kind of increase in globalization where we heard about what was going on in other countries. So these, where we may never have heard of some of these disasters and incidents because of TV and global reporting, we saw all this stuff happening around the world, and and communities saw it, and governments saw it, and so we had a whole raft of um, legislation. Um, and I suppose if I get to Australia at this point in time, um, we had a whole, basically it all poured out from, I think the late eighties with the Commonwealth Act through all of the states in the early to mid nineties. So then we got this role that was in our organization, which some of you may have done a role called, I definitely was my first job as a safety officer. Um, and this was about managing compliance to regulation. So let's be clear, kind of the modern, the modern part of our role is about, is about compliance. And so these are all these things. So we do safety management systems, inspections, audits, put in place behavior observation programs and certification of systems following on from the ISO 9000 series. So we have this sort of safety officer role where there's organizations put safety people in their business. And our role is to kind of run around and make sure that everything is um, following rules and, and, and doing what it should be. And then we kind of realized it was probably around 2000 or thereabouts um, that is it really the job of the safety person to um, manage all of this safety stuff? Isn't it a manager's job to, to manage safety? Um, they're the ones who manage the employees, so should, and they're the ones who manage the work, so shouldn't they manage the safety? So it is kind of evolution to a safety advisor. And this is kind of about, it was about supporting line management accountability for safety. So we would do the safety work in the background. We might do the investigations. We might do the audits. We might prepare communication material. But really, it was all about the supporting the leaders to lead safety. And this is where we started seeing this, this saying that, and some of you might believe it, I, I, I don't believe it, which is the role of a safety person is to do themselves out of a job. Um, if I can coach the manager to do what the manager needs to do, then they don't need me anymore. Um, I suppose that's an admission that there's no technical component to safety and there's also um, no value in an independent view on safety and there's also no change that happens in the workplace um, that needs to be understood from a safety perspective but we have these safety advisors um, in in organizations and then organizations got a bit frustrated with um with safety advisors going well it's kind of like all care no responsibility so they'll pop into the first um, 15 minutes of a management meeting, they'll deliver the, the LTI report and then they'll leave 15 minutes later and, and management will get on to, to do management stuff. And so they kind of, so organizations kind of said, we want our safety people to be more of a business partner. And this was a sort of trend that was happening in human resources and a lot of support functions in organizations saying, I want a safety par partner. I want someone who can partner with me to deliver all of my management goals and objectives. I want someone who can help me build safety programs and, and support my internal and external communications and, and put in place enterprise processes and, and integrate safety with the rest of my business and really support me in delivering organizational objectives. So I don't know if, if, if now people are thinking, well, that all makes sense. Um, that is all what we, what we want, but this, these are kind of, and I've had all these jobs and, and we've seen all these jobs in our organizations and organizations are probably at different points. But then the questions asked, I suppose, with safety, at least during my research, my conclusion was that you're still talking about safety and, and much of the work is still on the sidelines of the business. Much of the work is, is fragmented and isolated from the way that core operations run. It's seen, there's a real power differential between, between management and the safety professional. And in some regards, the safety profession has almost lost sight of the needs of the workforce because being so consumed with the needs of management and so we'll talk about this a bit later in the presentation, but my, my view of kind of like where we might be now is this idea of kind of maybe a fifth generation safety professional. And this is sort of pivoting off the back of what most people would um, know me to talk about in regards to um, resilience engineering or HRO or safety tool or safety differently or hop in this idea of saying, well, maybe we're an operations facilitator. Maybe we're about making sure organizations function and operations function in a way that um, creates safety. And so our role is maybe more about enhancing operational capacity of the organization. And these things there about what's our role in facilitating open communication at all levels across all functions of the business? How do we create foresight about operational risk? How do we reduce goal conflict in the business between cost and quality and, um, and production and safety? And how do we support work? So how do we understand and support 
um, the people who have to execute the work through kind of organizational um, um, decisions and, and organizational support. And you'll see once we hit there, it's kind of this idea of fifth generation safety professional that doesn't have the word safety in the way we think about the role, in the way that we carry out our role. And, and, and really maybe that thought that, um, you know, safety is, uh, safety emerges out of how we run the company. You kind of, as my good friend Pete Hudson at Cathay Pacific might say, you can't fix safety with safety. You have to fix safety by fixing the work um, and fixing the way that the organization functions and, and, and thinks about work and supports work. So I wanted to go backwards and then, you know, come to now and go in the future, because this is what we're grappling with when we when we think about this idea of how we have impact and, and what is this impact. So if our impact is to reduce risk, then how do we think about our role? If our impact is to um, educate management, how do we think about our role? If our impact is to um, um, engage the workforce, how do we think about that role? So this is this is a, a timeline and by all means, drop some Q and A in there. Um, I'm not gonna talk for you know, a, a huge amount of time and hopefully we're gonna have a fair bit of time to, um, to answer some questions. So then we start thinking about what's our purpose. Now, this is a purpose that I concluded um, about the role of a safety professional is to create foresight about changing the changing shape of risk and facilitate action before people are harmed. And it's probably due for me to update that. That's about 18 months old and my thinking's a bit evolved from there. But the three main things in that purpose is create foresight. So you know the incident that happened last week, but to what extent can you predict the incident that might happen next week in your role? And, and, and what advice can you give the organization around what might, what might lay around the corner when it comes to safety? So that idea of foresight, that idea of being proactive and proactive from a sense of view of actually um, knowing what scenarios might play out and what it might mean for safety and, and operations. And then how do you facilitate action? So this comes to your impact piece. So what action do you need to facilitate and how do you do it? So is the action about education? Is the action about um, risk intervention? And so, because at the end of the day, we need to be able to ideally see into the future. We need to be able to get something to change in our organization so that the future looks different. Okay, so let's, um, so let's now talk about that. So what I'm gonna run through now is eight ways to increase your impact. And I'm gonna cop out and not really define what I mean by impact, but maybe it's just about um, um, the feeling that others in the organization have about the difference that you're making. Um, and it could be in any of those um, areas that you've all described um, in there. And maybe as I go through, I'll try to be more specific with, with the impact that we're chasing. But this is not a simple answer. This is not just to say that um, our impact is reducing injuries. Because if we hang our hat on that, um, very difficult thing to prove and um, really hard to, to line up all the connections. So the way that everyone's been talking about it in the chat is the broad and complex way for us to think about our impact. And just before I move on, it's a good reflective exercise for everyone to do to think about what your purpose statement is. Um, and sometimes we think that's a little bit, you know, a little bit um, trite or um, um, I actually don't know what the PG version of the word is, but, you know, when organizations start talking mission and purpose, it can get a little bit like, you know, um, um, not that useful for my role, but I think if you've got a personal purpose, um, so my personal purpose, for example, is to enhance the capability of the global safety profession. Um, and I sort of anchor to that um, with with a lot of things that I do professionally, but have and so having that in your in in your role in your organisation can really help you make um, prioritise decisions and trade offs and um, and and know which battles are, are worth fighting based on what you're trying to do. So let's talk about impact then. Let's 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 have a bit of a go at this. And this this came out of an article that I'd. Um, it came out of an article that I published on LinkedIn a while ago, and and I'd also and it also got rerun in the AIHS journal. And I'll try to provide some new content. But this was me just kind of thinking about, well, if I had to advise a safety professional in their role, um, what they might do, things that they might think about for their role, what would they be? And and this is kind of what I came up with. So the first way to increase your impact is probably going to be by being obsessed about the work and not about the safety processes. So the safety processes are, are kind of just that. So, so the safety audits, the safety procedures, the safety management systems, the safety reports that need to happen, whether the actions are being closed out, whether leaders have done what leaders are supposed to do. All that stuff is fine and it kind of has to happen in the organization efficiently and kind of has to happen in the background. But if your decision has to be, which is that um, there's something going on, on on one of my sites that um, 
I uh, could be an emerging issue around something, but I've got this report that's due to my manager by the end of today. You know, what I'm saying is, is really um, being obsessed about people's work, understanding people's work, thinking about the safety of the work before we think about doing our safety work has kind of got to be one of our priorities. And it's going to be ways to increase your impact. Because I think at the end of the day, if you have the open conversation with a manager, if you have you know the open conversation with a group of workers, a conversation with the board, if you ask the question of, you know, do you want me to understand the work that people are doing today and what they need from the organization to support them and to jump on top of any emerging um, insights or weak signals in the business? Or do you want me to make sure I keep running this schedule of, of audits and make sure the investigation gets done in 28 days and make sure this report comes through? I kind of guarantee, um, probably hang my hat, that 99.9% .9 of people who you have that open, pragmatic conversation with are going to say, focus on the work, focus on the needs of the people, focus on what's emerging in the business. Um, so that's what I'd say about be obsessed with the work, not your safety processes and never trade off um, emerging issues in the business around safety for your pre-planned safety activities. Always show that you understand and care about people is sort of number two. So um, safety is first and foremost a people game. Um, if you don't like people or if you're not a people person, then you are in the wrong profession. If you want an easy job, you're in the wrong profession. Um, but I posted something on actually coincidentally on LinkedIn the other day about building relationships and creating influence. And, and the quote, um, I think it was an original Roosevelt quote, which was um, that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And if you're gonna have influence um, over people in, in your organization, um, it boils down to three questions that they're asking themselves when you're trying to influence them. The first person, the first question is, is probably okay, which is, um, oh, they're all okay. But the first question is, does this person know what they're talking about? And if you're a safety person and you're talking about safety stuff, then, you know, the first question is probably okay. Does this person know what they're talking about? The second question though is, do I think this person knows what it's like to be me? So do I think this person's putting themselves in my position, putting themselves in my shoes and giving me this advice or trying to influence me, influence me based on, you know, my position and my constraints and my objectives and my drivers. Um, and then the third, so this is about empathy. And the third question is about, do I think this person is acting in my interests, not their own? So, so this is the one, so, so you can think about the times that you provide advice from safety, which is you need to do this action to a manager. Like, okay, well, you're a safety person. That's okay. You can tell me to do that. Do you understand my budget? Do you understand my position? Um, and then the third thing is like, how is this going to benefit me if I do this action that satisfies your paperwork requirement? How's this going to help me? So you can quickly see that's a three test. It was established by Aristotle two and a half thousand years ago about credibility and influence to just say, does this person know their stuff? Do they know what it's like to be me? And do they, are they acting in my best interest? And so I've kind of been used that when I, when I roll through providing advice, if you can answer those questions or if people can answer those questions for themselves, then they're very likely to take on board. Um, the request and the advice that that you give to them. Um, invest in your own learning and growth. Growth safety is safety is hard. Like it's a really hard job. I, I I don't come across too many safety professionals that that haven't you know had hugely frustrating experiences in their career. Haven't talked about finding softer walls to bang their head against. There was a um, there was a article that was done on a group of French professionals and the researchers actually stopped the um, research in the middle. They're asking questions about the ability to influence. And there was responses like only 8% of so the safety professionals felt confident in having discussions um, with senior management. And they actually concluded that more than 20% of those professionals were in a state of what they call professional distress. Um, and I think um, Safety. There was another study in the US that ranked safety in, and I don't know the others, but in in the top five professions for people who hate their bosses. So, like in terms of like, and so, and I should I should know and should remember what the other four were, but you know, there's a chance on this call that a whole lot of people on this call hate their boss um, in safety, and and safety's tough, you know, and and it's really hard because um, you need to know how every person's doing their job on any given day, and you need to be able to operate at all levels of the business across all functions. Um, so investing in your own learning and growth is really critical for staying on top of your game um, and sort of um, 
making yourself more effective in both not technical and non-technical ways. Um, learning how to constructively have the difficult conversation. Now, this is also really, really important. Um, you sh shouldn't always agree with management. And one of the big problems um, with the role of safety as a safety advisor or safety partner is the power gradient that comes between line management and a safety professional, like a parent-child relationship. The manager is not always right when it comes to safety and neither are you probably, but, but if there's a good saying that if um, two people in the same organization always agree, then one of them's irrelevant. So your job is not always to agree with management. In fact, your job's not always to do everything that management asks you to do. Um, now, I'm not trying to be confrontational. What I've said here is to constructively have the difficult conversation. There's ways, there's ways of having these difficult conversations that bring people together, not leave them, leave them apart. So inquiring about the other person's perspective, being open um, about your own perspective and your own mo motivation around your perspective and the data and information that you're relying on to form that view, um, being prepared to concede um, your position in part to, to meet the other person somewhere in the middle, um, you know, winning wars by, by losing battles and all of these things. There's ways to actually constructively challenge people in your organization um, rather, than, rather than agree, 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 someone, you know, a line gets drawn and you basically give people ultimatums or you blow whistles or you, you know, you go to regulators or things like that. And I know people, you know, don't really do that, but we, we need to be the experts in the organization at having difficult conversations because so many different stakeholders in safety, so much gray area um, and so many competing objectives in an organization with safety means that we need to be able to do this every day really well. Um, Asking questions before you give opinions. Um, it's a little bit like a follow on from, from number four, but um, don't give an opinion around safety until you are confident that you've got enough context that that opinion is, is going to hit the mark. Um, and, 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 and don't dig in around a position until you've got a lot of, um, a lot of information. So the, the, the example that I give is I had a CEO once come to me, we'd had a an increase in recordable injuries for a month. And the CEO came to me and said, what are we gonna do for safety? We need to do something, what are we gonna do? So I said, well, I don't know. Um, do we even have a problem? Well, our, you know, well, our injury rate's up. Yeah, well, I don't know if that's a problem. So you're gonna to have to give me two weeks. Um, I'm gonna go and, I'll go and talk to um, the people in these parts of the business. I'll work with them. I'll understand what's going on, if there is anything going on. I'll get their input into what they think is gonna work. And I'll come back with, to you with an aligned position on what the workforce and management and I think is gonna take us forward, but you have to give me two weeks to do that. Um, so this, this idea of you know, not having to have a response, um, you know, taking things on notice and being clear about the process you're gonna to go to before you arrive at your opinion. Um, it's, it's sort of about, like I did at the start of this presentation with the timeline rather than jump straight in here. It's about going slow to go fast. And that's the language that you should use with your organization to say, we can spend a lot of money. Um, the organization can jump based on what I'm gonna say now, but it may or may not be the thing that the organization needs um, to happen. So asking lots of questions, getting lots of context, 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 before you give your opinion. Um, always keeping your cool and staying rational. So safety is a hugely emotional topic inside organizations. You know, um, workers get fired over safety issues. Um, careers get made or broken. Um, you know, you know, managers get promoted and um, and sidelined based on say perceived safety performance or safety commitment, perceived safety commitment. Um, safety professionals always get emotional, um, throw their toys out of the cot. Um, I've done it a number of times in my career, n not proudly, but um, I've definitely made statements to my organizations um, about saying, if you want that done, you're gonna to have to find someone else to do it. And it's not helpful. Um, so being cool, staying rational, following some of the advice earlier in some of those points, um, letting, letting people be emotional, but not needing to be emotional. Um, now I'd say safety is always gonna be emotional because we care about people. So it's always gonna be about people, but we shouldn't get emotional over decisions or, or relationships always play the ball, um, never, never play the person. Um, creating space in your day to be curious and to explore weak signals. Um, the challenge that I, that I put out to safety people is to try to keep 50% of their, their week as white space. Now, I know that's really hard and I've worked in roles of having back-to-back -back 
nine to five or eight till six or something, Monday to Friday and feeling really busy going from meeting to meeting, discussion to discussion. But the whole organization is functioning out there um, with people at the point of risk and, and, and me running 40 hours a week in and out of different types of meetings, disconnected from the reality of what's going on in the operation. So this, this space to be directly connected to what's happening in real time in your organization, and this includes everything to building relationships, having coffees with managers, finding out what's on people's plates, finding out what new um, challenges are, are arising in the business. I started um, planning my week in my last role a few years ago on Mondays by calling all of the site managers at all of the major um, hazard sites that we ran and asking them what was happening that week. You know, what's coming up this week? What, it, you know, what, um, what are you worried about or uncertain about? What are the big ticket items um, from an operations and a safety point of view? And importantly, what do you need help with this week? Because I've got a whole safety organization that I can mobilize around you this week if you need help. And people might say, well, that's being in the weeds. That's not being very proactive. But I'd probably counter that and say, well, I think that's ultimately proactive in terms of understanding the needs of your people today, tomorrow, for the rest of the week, and trying to rally your, or mobilize your organization's resources around supporting them. So you've got to have space to do that. You, you can't just ring a manager and say, hey, how can I help you this week? And they say, oh, I'd really love you to come to site, or I'd really love you to look at this on Thursday when we're doing this activity um, and say, oh, sorry, I'm, I've got meetings all day Thursday. I can't move that. Um, that sort of cycles you back up to point number one. And then number eight um, is it's fine for us to sit here as a group of safety um, professionals and, you know, 98 people, most of whom I assume on the call are going to be safety professionals and think about, okay, this is great. I, I, I sort of think this is the way that I can do my role. Um, I've got to kind of, you know, change where my priorities are. I've got to, I've got to you know, do these things. And then the organization sucks you back in and the, the institutional forces in your organization, the structural forces are always going to be stronger. Well, the majority of the time are going to be stronger than your own individual agency, your own personal ability to break free of those organizations expectations on your role. You, you know, so, so I think proactively having those conversations with, with, with your, your safety organization, with your management team um, and with your workforce about, let's let's agree what the most effective role that the safety organization can play for the business and play out some of these things you know how much time you know tell your organization do you know that we've got 100 people in our safety organization and we collectively spend 80 percent of our time managing the safety processes and and reporting and things like that um that's an investment of i don't know um 20 million dollars a year in salary is you know, are we getting the benefit from that? Is that what we want our safety people for, for doing? What if that was only 50% of their time? What could we use that other 30% of time for? So I sort of encourage people to um, go back to your organization, have these conversations and, and try to work out the an aligned view of what the role is you can play. And then you can keep anchoring around that. I think the, la the last story on that I'd say is, you know, having the conversation is really important about your role. And, 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 and if, particularly if you want things to be different in your job, or you think there's a way that it can be different and better, um, don't hesitate to have that conversation. I asked a room of people um, earlier in the year when you could still have a room of people, um, who believes that recordable injury rates are a good measure of your organization's safety performance? And basically no hands went up. And I kind of said, well, put your hand up if you've had that conversation out with your senior management team. And less than 50% of the hands went up. And so you kind of can't be sitting there wishing for something to be different. Um, and this is a bit of the tough love statement. It, you can't really wish for something to be different with unless you're prepared to um, call it out and have the conversation and try to make it different. I think as when, when I talked about that evolution of the professional, we're at a point now where the organization's our organizations are probably happy for us to stay in this safety partner mode. You know, management are getting served. They're getting all of their needs met. We're getting all these safety processes and, and activities. We, if an incident occurs, we quickly wrap it up in a bow. We retrain someone, write a new procedure, send a safety alert. Things get kind of, you know, wrapped up. Um, managers probably are, are, are happy with us being there, but I actually think there's a more valuable role for the, for the profession that we've actually got to create for ourselves. And it may actually be the first time in the modern history of the profession where we will actually create our own professional future. I think we've reacted 
in safety officer mode, in in safety advisor mode, in safety partner mode, we've actually reacted um, and and responded as a profession to the role that others wanted us to play. And I'm kind of advocating now that we can we can um, shape a role for ourselves and our organisations um, that's you know going to be really impactful into the future. Um, I wanted to. Um, I'm going to skip over one slide, so you'll get it in the pack. But um, I want to give enough time for discussion. So I want to leave sort of three key three key takeaways before I jump in jump into Q and A. Um, and these are just these are open questions. You may or may not agree with these, but they're just sort of reflection points. The first would be that, you know, at the moment in a number of our organisations, we see the management as our customer, and I'm of the view that the person exposed to the risk is always the customer. We may work through management by educating them and, 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 and helping them make decisions and that. But in the front of our mind, we should always have the person who's exposed to the risk as our, as our customer. I'd sort of say that say, the safety of the work is always more important than the safety work. Um, so if there is a trade-off between um, an emerging issue that is directly impacting kind of work or, or an opportunity to understand how work's being done and, and what that might mean for safety. That's always more important than our than our safety work because it's always it, it's it's always going to be more closely connected to the injury than our safety work activities or the potential injury. And then the third thing there is that um, this idea of being focusing on proactive risk management as opposed to reactive corrective action. So think about the balance in your role between the reactive corrective action, so being that detect and repair mechanism mechanism for your organization. So being the person that closes out the audit action or doesn't closes out the audit actions, the investigation actions and, and sort of fixes last week's problems, as opposed to being the one that's driving decisions around what might be next week's um, problems that arise. So with that, what I'd really love to do, Sarah, if we can, is um, call at least my, um, my rambling talking there and um, give ourselves 20 minutes or so of Q&A. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, good, because my my microphone was confusing me. All right. So Rob is the first question. And he said, uh, something I've heard discussed with operational construction managers with a lot of new entrants to the safety profession, now seemingly coming from the tertiary university pathway, how credible are they to provide operational advice if they've not come from an operational industry background? And how do these people therefore make meaningful impact? Yeah, that's a great question, Rob, um, and one that's worthy of a very long end. That could almost be a be a webinar of its of its own. Look, I think um, I think it's a balance. We've got a balance of people, tertiary entry safety professionals, and um, and operational experience safety professionals. I think if you've got a team, the best thing you can do is have a balance of both, um, because having those different coming at problems from different angles is is a good thing to to do. Um, but I. But I think I think you've got to I think you need to help people who don't have operational backgrounds um, get an empathy for operations. So when I the very first job I got straight out of university, so I went to school, safety degree at university, graduate safety officer job um, in a rail organisation, and my manager there. This was twenty years ago. My he said for my first four weeks, my target was spend thirty five hours a week in the field and report back on who I'd. Um, met what I'd learned about work. And that was on the basis of, I don't care about your qualifications. If you don't understand the work that we do and you don't have good relationships, then you are no good to me. Um, All right. So um, Camel asks, even if you have that difficult conversation and management doesn't listen and you don't end up being able to facilitate the controls necessary to safeguard people and someone is seriously hurt or killed without being insensitive to the people who've been affected, how do you use that event to get the buy-in from management in the future? Yeah, look, I mean, I, if that's personal experience, um, Camel, I'm, I'm sorry for that story. Um, I think I, I think I'd hope that you could you could get to a point that you would get at least enough of your advice listened to to be able to um, to be able to move forward. Um, so so, but assuming that the outcome has happened the way that you said, um, I think you've, there's got to be some kind of meeting of the minds um, because obviously you've seen something that you haven't been able to explain to the manager or you haven't been able to present in a way that the manager has been able to see it as clearly as, you, as you've been able to see it. So I would almost approach that quite humbly and, and almost, almost because the manager is going to be 
you know, hugely defensive and hugely challenged. I'd almost use it as an opportunity to build the relationship by saying, look, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry I couldn't help you um, get to that decision. Um, there must have been something in what I was seeing that you weren't able to see because of the way I was providing you that information and almost come to some kind of agreement about how you're going to communicate and interact around these difficult conversations in the future. So hopefully asking them to be more open-minded and, and, and just, you know, saying things like, when I bring you something so strongly as I brought it to you this time, I'll only do that when I am, you know, in my professional opinion, really convinced that you need to act. And what I'm hoping of you is when I do do that, um, you'll be very open-minded about why I'm, you know, taking that position. So I, I, I think the only way to do that is to basically use it as this way to, um, to, to lean in and, and, and publicly accept that your 50% of the relationship wasn't able to get the decision made as much as the other person's 50% relationship and, and, and try to make a plan to move forward. So Greg says, asks, what shape do you see this new emerging role taking? Look, I can send around a paper. There's actually probably the best thing for Greg to do. Um, and I know a Greg Cameron, I don't know if it's the same Greg. Um, so probably the best thing to do is go to the back catalogue of Myosh um, webinars. And Sarah, you might be able to put this in, in, in some way, link it to, because I did a whole webinar on the, the emerging role of the safety profession um, well, six months ago or nine, a while ago, but maybe Sarah, if you know the one that I'm talking to, we can we can drop that in a link to this one as well. Yeah, we'll find it and have a look right now while you're talking. Okay. So um, Britta asked in the last three key takeaways, are your customers also your worker? So if you're, okay, so when I talk about the person exposed to the risk is, is, is the customer, I mean, the workforce or the people doing the dangerous work or the people who are using your products or, or, um, you know, but if you're a manager, then, you know, obviously, um, obviously that your workers are, are your customer too. So look, I think, I think what I'm trying to do there in that statement is people have, we formed a fairly myopic view that our role is to support line management. Um, our role is to advise line management. And I'm just, I'm trying to call out there that there's a broader customer, Customer base that we need to have in our considerations around our decisions every day and, and where we spend our time. All right, I have that link. Um, just let me pop it in the chat. Um, hang on, I'll start with the next question. Um, Stuart says, how do you overcome operational ambivalence to safety? Look, um, I, I don't, I suppose there's, Stuart, I think, I mean, there might be, I mean, I suppose it's, it's a small question in the chat, but um, I, maybe maybe a disconnection would an operational disconnection might be better than ambivalence. Like I think I'd hope that people don't try and hurt their, hurt themselves. So I think what I try and do is be curious around where that connection is breaking down between how how you and the organisation think about safety and how people in the operations, maybe frontline management or workers, think about it. Either you're seeing important things that they're not seeing as important in terms of creating safety, or they they they're lacking education or awareness. So I think that's a great basis to have, you know, something like a learning team conversation and, and that, and, you know, asking them questions about what they rely on to keep themselves safe, what the organization could do to support them better. Um, and, and start to probe around these, this perception that you're seeing call, like asking them about, you know, we see this, you know, we see you guys not, um, not following this process very often. Is there a problem, you know, like, can we improve it? So I just think it's a great, if that's what you're seeing, I think it's a, great opportunity to um, lean in. And maybe that's like that other question um, as well, post, you know, about post difficult conversation is always look for the opportunity to lean in. Um, and like I say, stay rational, unemotional, and um, you'll build strong relationships by these observ by observing these things and then leaning into them. All right, Kat Kathleen asks, how do you facilitate the client objective, which is all about reporting? How many safety tasks have we done, behaviours, observations, safety alerts, DNA tests, et cetera? How many incidents have we had, et cetera? To me, this is the noise that defocuses on what we need to be doing that is shifting culture, empowering others to be safety leaders, et cetera. Look, I think, um, Kathleen, I'd um, and talked to a few contracting organisations about this. Um, there's a few options. You can either... Um, do what your client wants and, and run that in your own organization. You can run like a two speed safety program where you prepare and deliver the information the client wants, but then you run a 
parallel program in your own organization. So you might have to send all these tasks and observations and alerts and DNA tests to your client, but you use something different to facilitate the safety conversation in your own organization, or you start, or you prepare what you're doing. And then at the start of projects or, or in the, in the tender sales phase, you put on the table, how you manage safety and you try to get agreement during the negotiation that during this project, um, you know, they'll support you to manage safety, safety in this way. Um, and over time, this will change, you know, I think, um, over time, progressively organizations will move some of this way, but I think they're the three options you've got to either do what the client wants, run two systems, or try to influence your client, at least for your own projects, that you've got a better solution to this than, than what their standard solution is. So anonymous person asks, I work, <laughs> I work at a company that has very low HSC maturity. I have spent three years trying to change this, but the sales focus is overwhelming. Any advice to start getting the business to own safety more and not focus so much on sales? Look, I mean, the business is always going to focus on sales and project delivery because that's its core business. So the question that you, I suppose, need to do is how you start making safety relevant to, um, to sales and execution. So you know, for example, um, I, I suppose start integrating the process. So if I understand the question um, or the, con the organizational context right around this question, um, people are seeing safety, people will be seeing safety as a cost. So you're going to need to try to show them the return um, on, on safety, or at least make anything you're trying to do in the safety space relatively low cost and, and, and easy to explain what the benefit is. And then starting to try to provide support into the sales and project execution process. So starting to say, look, if we don't um, know what we're doing for safety, then we don't know how to cost it. So we don't know how to sell it. So we don't know how to... Include what we, um, we get stung by all this extra safety cost that eats into our margin. Um, so I think that... Um, I don't, without knowing if it's a product business or a service business or exactly the stage of maturity, it's hard to give you any more specific advice. But um, I think, um, yeah, three years is a long time to be trying to, yeah, get get kind of a start. So feel free to contact me offline if you like. Drop me a note on LinkedIn. Um, and if you can give me some more specifics one-on-one, -on -one, I'll give you my thoughts. Okay. And also to Anonymous, I've just put a link in the chat to everyone, which is a research paper that we did on how work safety impacts oh, cool. performance, profit and culture. So there's a few examples you can give to your management there. So another Anonymous um, has said, with the pending legislative change in WA moving to a duty around provision of H&S advice, how do you see this impacting the profession? Look, I think it's an interesting one. I, I, I think it doesn't impact a lot in the short term um, because it's like industrial manslaughter, but it might be one of these, but, but I don't know one of the, what it could do. So a few organizations might got, start going, oh, geez, um, I better check the qualifications that my, that my um, safety people have because, you know, one of the ways of, you know, there's a, so if I can get someone who's got a safety degree, if I can get someone who's worked in a safety job in a previous company, if I can get someone who's certified with the AIHS, there's going to be things that I suppose will start floating through about what that um, what that capability and competence looks like to provide advice. Um, the other side of this is obviously the duties on people providing advice. Um, so I suppose the first time that a consultant walks out of a company and then a month later that that, that company has a fatality um, around the scope of work the contract the consultant was doing, obviously there's a there's a risk in there. I still think it's a good move for the profession, um, to be perfectly honest. I, I think, like I'm not advocating a uni background or an operational background, but what I am advocating is a minimum um, threshold or a minimum barrier to entry as a safety role. Anyone can take a safety officer or a safety advisor job now. You actually don't need any qualification. It's the only profession or occupation that impacts people's health or well-being. Um, in kind of a safety sense that doesn't have a barrier to entry. You need a qualification to be a security guard, to be a personal trainer, to be a nutritionist, to be any sort of allied health professional or let alone any medical professional. And you can advise organizations on, on critical health and safety risks um, one week out of working in the mailroom. So I just think that whatever it looks like, it's a positive step, but we'll wait to see what it actually, what it actually means. But um, yeah, that's kind of my position on that. So Campbell asks, are the challenges we are facing now somewhat the same as the managers were facing previously with having little time to invest in their staff and their continued professional development? 
Yeah, look, I think we exactly are. So we've, you know, our managers have been busy for a long time, too busy to kind of connect with their staff and do things, um, you know, because they're so busy um, doing doing their stuff and meetings. And I think safety is exactly the same. We're, we're probably too busy to focus on on the work and the risk and, um, and, and that because we've got so much stuff on our plates now because our, you know, the systems of safety work that we're managing is is so big and growing and every time there's a new incident or audit or strategy or committee meeting or, or management plan, there's more stuff for us that we have to do. So I think that um, that example is a really good one, Campbell. Okay, so Christian, what are your thoughts on focusing attention on those that are left to make calls at a local level, e.g. leading hands? Look, I think um, I think frontline leaders are the critical are a critical link in all of this. They're the link between middle and senior management and the workforce. They're the link often between the safety professional and the workforce. Um, they're there every day, and their sole purpose is to set expectations around. What well, so their purpose is to set expectation around work, enable their people to be able to execute that work, to monitor, to make sure that work's happening in line with the plans and the execution. And then to obviously create that environment of open communication and um, and psychological safety within a team. So, frontline. So, if you're gonna if you're gonna put one program into your strategy, um, I, I don't want to say that they're um, solely responsible for safety, but it'll be the program where if you do well, um, you will you know be able to have a direct and measurable impact if you can get a genuine um, engagement and and support of frontline and leading hands. Um, it's a tough job they face though. They're in the you know, proverbial um, sandwich, um, you know, getting getting crushed between safety and compliance and productivity and cost and what management wants and what the workforce wants and what um, safety professional wants and, and everywhere else. So they, you know, they're definitely pulled and pushed around and, and, and often not very well supported. So I would definitely focus attention on the importance of those roles in the business. I'd focus organizational support in developing their capability and, and, and an understanding in the organization about, um, just how critical the role is that they play. Um, definitely. So Campbell says with, re with respect to risk management, which do you think is a more important conversation, critical risk at the front end or residual risk at the back end? Um, great. Yeah. Okay. Um, good, good question. So um, probably critical risk at the front end. Um, they're both, but I, I, okay, let's say both. <laughs> Can I say both? So critical risk at the front end is really important um, to know kind of what, what, what could happen in your business. Um, and residual risk kind of assumes that um, makes a whole lot more assumptions than the critical risk. So the residual risk assumes that, you know, you've identified and put in place all the controls that those controls are working and effective. So I'd be kind of focused mostly on the process that happens between the critical risk at the front end and the residual risk at the back end, which is all of the, I suppose, which is the, which is the control environment and the effectiveness of those controls. And I suppose when we talk about, um, you know, colleague of mine at Forgework, Avitza, who's kind of a risk expert, who's actually written all of the risk stuff for um, the Safety Futures Program, is actually about, you know, um, you know, are my about independent protection layers? You know, how many controls do I have around my critical risks, and are those roles? Are those, are those going to be you know, independent? Are they available? Are they reliable? And you know, these, these things that happen more in risk engineering and, and process safety management are things that I think would you know, be a real game changer if we applied them in occupational health and safety. Okay. I haven't read Luke's question, so I'm just going to read it live. <laughs> this is probably something that is more of a generalised question. I get this question raised fairly often amongst people of our generation. Gen X and Gen Y and older generations. Do you think that we are becoming too complacent with WHS and common sense? I think what we, I think that we, um, we, our organisations are safe um, or our organisations are safe, not just because of the safety work and the effort that we put into them because of how our people manage their work. And that's true everywhere. And we've been able, I suppose, looking at this generational change and what's happening, working with a few organisations that are having hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of experience um, fall out of their workforce at the moment through retirement. So people who, you know, in operational environments or control rooms or these places spent 30 or 40 years knowing how to do the job, knowing how to fill the gaps, knowing how to respond to situations, knowing how to kind of um, get work done and keep it safe and have a lot of experience with things that have gone wrong during their career. And I just think that um, our, our 
systems, so our approaches to safety and, and, and management are going to be caught out in the next five years because we, we unknowingly um, are being propped up, if you like, or supported um, by all of this kind of experience um, from, from generations who are leaving our workforce, you know, and, and this is people between in their fifties to seventies. I was talking to a company this morning that are rolling off, you know, in maritime sector, rolling off people in their seventies now and, and, you know, ships masters who've been piloting ships for 50 years. Um, and I just, I don't know. I just think we're going to see, unless we can get ourselves organized around some of these things that we're talking about today, um, around our focus as an organization, our understanding of work and our support for it. I think, organizations are going to be caught out in the next five to 10 years significantly. Okay. This is a good question. I, it's anonymous. I have to attend board of director meetings as the company H&S manager three times a year. What is the one question I should ask them about their commitment to H&S? Oh, good. Um, good, good question. The board of directors. Um, Ooh, one question. Um, on the spot. Yeah, no, look, I mean, I, I want to give a good question because if the person runs off and, and does it, so I'd also encourage this person, Anonymous, to reach out to me on LinkedIn because I currently chair um, some board safety committees independently on behalf of companies and, and work quite closely with some boards. But the specific thing about their commitment to health and safety is, um, so asking them for some time is always a good measure of their commitment. So when something something comes up that in the discussion, giving them the opportunity to say, oh, before the next meeting, let's find some time and I'll take you through that in, in some detail. So if they've asked a question and they're committed, then they'll say, yeah, okay, let's, yeah, let's do that. Um, if they've just asked the question to go through the motions of asking the question, say, no, no, that's okay. It can wait till the next meeting or just, just send me an email or something. Then that's a good way of, I suppose, testing for yourself, their commitment. Um, I think, but that's a bit un, under the table, but so don't tell them that I said that. Um, but then the second part of that would, might be something like, um, asking them what they want to see in their organization in relation to health and safety that they that you know the organization is currently not doing so then you'll actually get a sense of their commitment to health and safety because if they say no we're happy with everything that we're seeing in there then they maybe don't have a bigger vision for the company than what you're currently giving them so i if you're going to ask one thing i'll probably end every every meeting with is you know between now and next meeting or or what what would you like to see in the organization in relation to health and safety that you're currently not seeing and just see how big their, their, their vision for what it could be. And I suppose the bigger, the bigger the statements they make and the bigger the vision, probably the bigger their commitment when you come and ask them for, okay, now we want to do that. So. Okay. That's a bit helpful. Yeah. That sounds like another webinar. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, Dave, there's no more questions and um, there was a lot of chat going on. Um, so I will try and save that chat as well. Um, so if you have anything else to say, otherwise we'll wrap this up. And um, thanks a lot. It was, has been really, really good. And a lot of feedback is coming through the chat as well. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate you taking the time out. And um, feel free if I didn't, if you didn't, if you think of a question after the session, or if, um, or if you want a better answer than the one that I gave to your question in the session, then just um, get in touch. Great. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Have a great day.